Are we recording? We are recording. Good. We've got our art pluses on the back for tech today. So thanks, boys. I don't know. Annabelle's not there, is she? Oh, she is there. And girl. Sorry, Annabelle. Hello. Sorry. Hello. Sorry. I could only see two boys. I didn't see Annabelle in the middle. Um, bless all three of you. Good job. This scripture is an interesting one. I want to start by thinking about something. How is it that we follow God? How is it we found God? Well, in Romans chapter 3, verse 11, Paul declares this. No one seeks God. Think about that for a second. You're here. It's not because you sought God. I didn't seek God. Sometimes we can kid ourselves about how we've ended up in church. The truth is, is God has sought us. God comes out to meet us. God speaks to us and invites us to him. Now, for many of us, the reason we've got this far is because Christians have come alongside what God is doing. You know, the Bible says the spirit's abroad. It's at work in the world. And through obedience, Christians, think of the people that helped you get to the point where you made a commitment to Jesus, those of you that have made one. It came because other people heard Jesus say, go and tell people. And they went and they helped. And God sought us out, the Bible says, to be our good father. And I, I have to say, there's an emphasis there on good, because truthfully, some of us had terrible fathers. And we struggle with this word, this image of God being our father, because for some of us, our father was, was absent or had died or was abusive. He was alcoholic. He was many things. And we don't see a good image. But the Bible tells us that God is our good father, that God has drawn us with loving kindness and that our path to rescue starts by God seeking us and in John's gospel, sending Jesus to be rescue for us. And that makes you and I subjects of divine initiative. You're here because God saw you. Most of you are nice to other people. Few of us are really nice to ourselves at times. But often we're quite terrible to ourselves. We're hard on ourselves. Sometimes we need to be, but quite often we're, we're hard on ourselves in bad ways. But God initiated love for us and came to rescue us, to rescue us from sin, to rescue us from ourselves, to rescue us from eternal separation from him. From eternity, you see this in John 1, right at the beginning, from eternity, God calls with compassionate love to you and to all of our world. And that's really what we must remember. Those of us that have the love of Christ, it's not that we might have it, it's that we might share it. It rescues us that we might be rescuers with him. So look, three Sundays ago, because we've had harvest and we've had communion, we looked at John the Baptist, the baptizer. He had a mission of heart prep for the Messiah to prepare people for repentance. And now in this passage, the next day, as John wrote it down, John the writer, not John the Baptist. The next day, John the Baptist is with some of his disciples and they start to follow Jesus themselves and, and they bring others to him. Now, Andrew is the one that's named. Now, there's one not named in this first pair and it's John, it's John the writer. There's other places in the Gospel of John where John doesn't call himself John. He, he says things like an unnamed disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved. He, for some reason, doesn't name himself. Perhaps if you wrote a book and you were part of the story, you'd have to think, I read a book just last week and all the way through it, the author referred to himself in the third person. That was a bit weird. They always said their whole name when they were talking about themselves. But John and Andrew were with the baptizer and the baptizer says, look, here is 
the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. You can see Jesus walking through. Jesus was baptized and he's walking through. And Andrew and John leave the baptizing. Why? Because he has just said, the one that bridges the unbridgeable gap between people and God is walking through your sight right now. He's here. And so they follow him. They walk after him. They're following now, not the baptizer, but the rescuer. They're following the son of God. And Jesus saw that they were following him. And he, he says to them, what do you want? What are you looking for? In response to that, they call him rabbi. They call him teacher. And they ask him where he is staying. And that's how they declare that they want to follow him. They want to follow him too. Where, you are, where are you staying, teacher? Because we want to stay where you're staying. And when they call him rabbi, rabbi is not the same word as a pastor or a vicar. I mean, we use rabbi in the scriptures. But when they used rabbi and they spoke to Jesus, they actually meant great one. So they have a, a need. They have a decision to turn to follow him. And Jesus invites them with him. And in that, that's because God has been stirring them up, as we've seen. They've repented. Their hearts are ready for salvation. And God stirs them up. And, you know, sometimes as Christians in church, or some of us aren't yet Christians, we have a sense that God's speaking to us. Sometimes it could be through a sermon or a song or through prayers. We just get this just general feeling that God's speaking to us. And what do we do? We sit on it. We wait. We act like a chicken with an egg. Just keep this warm for a while and see what happens. But actually, when we feel God speaking and we don't respond, then often the seed of change, the moment where God has said something to us, it gets snatched away. It gets snatched away by our rationalized mind. It gets snatched away by the devil. When God speaks, respond. You know, if you're in a place in a church service where you're honest and you realize you need prayer for something, don't mess about. Respond. Say to somebody, pray for me. Help me. I'm struggling. If you need to speak to someone because there's a problem, don't say, I'll sit on it a few days. And if I see them wearing pink on a Tuesday in the street, I'll do it. Do it. Respond. When the scripture speaks to you, when it challenges you, when it stirs you up, when you know that God is trying to draw you near, always respond. Because if they'd have said, ah, oh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, if he hops half a mile away, I'll follow him. No, follow him. Respond. So they have been invited by Jesus then with these words, come and you will see. Now this phrase here is a promise. Jesus was not just going to take them to the place where he was camping. He wasn't come and see what my tent's like tonight, or which rock I'm going to be sleeping under. He said, come and see, because I'm going to reveal to you who I am. And we know who he was, because we've been told at the beginning, he was the word made flesh. The word came down and made his dwelling among us. And as they respond to this invitation, they're going to see the truth of God alive, alive in his actions, alive in their lives. Think about what a promise that is. Think about what a promise that still is. Come and see, is what Jesus says to us all. See, all of us who receive Jesus must follow what Andrew did, what John did. Accept Jesus willingly. See him. Follow him. Look at the truth of who he is and believe on that. Have you responded to that? Have you followed him in that way? If you haven't, you should. So they sleep, more than sleep, actually, because the next thing John tells us is they go to Philip. You've got your Bible open. You'll see that they go to Philip. The next thing is, is Jesus meeting with Philip. Now, if we had a, 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 an understanding of the pictures and the geography of this scripture, this is what we would see. We know John the Baptist was baptizing people for repentance, and he was doing that about 20 miles east of Jerusalem. We'll call east over here, east of Jerusalem. 
Now, as we've looked at the passage before this, the Holy Spirit brings Jesus to John the Baptist and Jesus is baptized. Now, that's quite weird because Jesus did not live 20 miles east of Jerusalem. Jesus lived about 140 odd miles away in the north. What I think is going on here is John is baptizing when the festivals are on in Jerusalem, when the pilgrims pour down to Jerusalem for the events. And I think looking at the way John's um, chronology evolves over these first couple of chapters, because chapter two is at Passover, I think at this point um, we're at harvest. So we've just done our harvest. We know what harvest is, don't we? For the Jews, harvest was the festival of the booths where they would fill the city and the surrounding countryside with little temporary tents. And over a week in Jerusalem, they would celebrate God's goodness as they were people on the move. So I think what's happened is, is Jesus and so many Jews are down around Jerusalem for this festival. John is baptizing for repentance. John baptizes Jesus. And at the end of this festival, this is what happens. Jesus then walks away. Andrew and John see Jesus and they choose to follow him. So the next day, they go to Philip, who's over 100 miles away. They walk all the way back from the east of the Jordan, east of Jerusalem, all the way back up to nearly the top of Lake Galilee. 100 miles. That is no quick walk. But when they do, they get there to Philip. And that made me think about something. Jesus was willing to walk 100 miles or more. Um, I've still got the plane or something going through my head every time I think about that sort of distance. I know it's not enough. It's not 500, but it's there in my head. He walked all this way just to have a chance to be with Philip. How much effort would we put in to give someone else their moment to meet Jesus? How much are we willing to do? It's nothing in Jesus' head to walk 100 miles to go to Philip. Sometimes... We won't even put in a basic level of effort to help someone find Jesus because we're too busy shopping or doing things. We've got too much else on. Nothing was going to get in the way. No one was going to be excluded. Jesus does that trip over, let's guess, what, a week? Maybe three days if they walk really fast. But it's a lot of walking in the desert over 100 miles, maybe 120. And when they get there, Jesus calls to Philip and he, and he says, Akolothai. He says, Philip, come and join with me. Cleave to me. Be in union with me. Find unity in me. Be my brother. Be part of my family. Philip, come and live life in the same flow as me, with the same destination as me. Identify with me. Live life under me is your ruler. That's what Jesus says. And Philip says yes. Philip says yes. It's amazing. So we've seen Andrew, and we've seen John Hyden, and we've seen Philip all meet Jesus and come to him. Now, the first two, they heard about Jesus and they followed. And the third one, Jesus went to them directly. Somebody said being a Christian is like having a torch lit that we then must go and light other torches with. Simple analogy, isn't it? You know, we don't use burning torches. We're not very mob-like, but we know what a burning torch is. Let's think about the lit torch lighting others. Andrew's brother, Simon, Philip's friend, Nathaniel, in verse 41, it's very sure for Andrew. When he's convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, he takes that firm conviction straight to Simon, straight to his brother. Now, how firm is your conviction about Jesus? It's easy to say, dead firm again, isn't it? It's easy to say that. Talk is cheap. Conviction without conversation is pie in the sky we're really convicted that Jesus is our Messiah, then we have to take him to everyone. 
if we really believe that he is the son of God and he's rescued us and he's got the only one with the power of eternal life for people, we have to take that to people. Otherwise, it's hypocrisy. It's nonsense. And you know what? I think if you are convicted that Jesus is your God, take it to people. Because otherwise your faith is like one fly toilet paper. It's useless. It's, it doesn't hold anything. Take it to people. It's not easy. And Andrew does it in one of the hardest places that many of us know. Family. Andrew takes his conviction to his family. That's challenging. But you know what? When Jesus meets Simon, the door opens. Because when we get Jesus to people... We're not the one that does all the persuading. Sure, we have to live like Jesus. But Jesus is the one that convicts them. Jesus is the one that speaks. Jesus is the one that transforms. That's what he does with Simon. The door opens and he says to Simon, see who you were. Let me tell you who you are going to be. Let me tell you what your new name will be. And Peter, like so many in the Bible, find God and they get a new identity. And then it's Philip and Nathaniel. Nathaniel, if Nathaniel was in Disney, I think Nathaniel would probably be Eeyore. If you know Eeyore, you know Eeyore, don't you? The, the donkey with Winnie the Pooh. Everybody likes Eeyore. Nathaniel is quiet. Nathaniel is fed up. He's down. Nathaniel has had hopes repeatedly dashed about God ever sending the Messiah. And yet, Nathaniel's heart is genuine. He still cried out to God for rescue. And Philip comes in and says, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. And he's from Nazareth. And when Nathaniel stops laughing, he basically says, can anything good come from Nazareth? But he agrees very kindly to meet Jesus. If you look in verse 47, Jesus then says to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, you know, there's no deceit in you. I've seen you in so many ways. This is going to change your life. This is what he says. You, you've got it in your scripture. The Holy Spirit speaks to Jesus about Nathaniel. He says, look, here's a man of no deceit. A rare man, a man of no deceit, a man of prayerful hope, a man under the fig tree. Now, I hate figs. Doesn't mean anything. I just need to say it. every time I see the word fig, I just think of a fruit that tastes like pesto. I don't understand figs at all. Anyway, for the Jews, figs were really figs and fig trees were really symbolic of God's provision. Figs was, trees were seen as a place of peace, a place of rest, a place for private worship. Fig trees would be a place where a Jew could come before God and really pray and say, God, you've done this. And in a land that was not theirs that they'd sown, a big, luscious fig tree full of figs, yeah, um, they would have loved them. Jesus says to him, I saw you, I saw you praying for Israel's rescue. I saw you under that fig tree. Your heart is truth loving. You are faithful. There is no deceit in you. And you know what? The way Philip and Nathaniel responds is true. Because if Nathaniel was a man for truth, then it took the truth of what Jesus said to convince him of who Jesus was. Because if he was such a man of truth, he would have just gone, you're having a laugh, mate. I don't know who you are. Look at what he says. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, I think because there's a little bit of this difference here in the Gospels, Nathaniel is only in John. I think if you look at the other Gospels, Nathaniel's new name is Bartholomew. I think he's the disciple Bartholomew we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Chapter 1 ends with Jesus. 
Jesus responds to the faith that he's seen. He's the revelation of God. He's the one who reveals to us greater things. He's the only one who opens the door of heaven to any of us. And in this place, John reminds us that Jesus is the son of man. He's our Lord, our King, our Savior. And he is, in fact, the perfect picture of a man. Everything God wants people to be. I know, ladies, you're not men. But don't worry, one day, men, you'll be the bride. So it's soul swings and roundabouts. But everything a person should be, we see perfectly in Jesus. Andrew, Simon, John, Philip, Nathaniel, and the others they're going to be disciples of Jesus, his apprentices. And as we see their story unfold, we must continue to work out how our life can be like theirs was, how we can be apprentices to Jesus as they were, how we can learn from the one whose yoke is easy, who said at harvest, and whose burden is light. I want you to think about one thing as we finish. Think about Andrew and Philip's priority on finding Jesus. What they were desperate for was to get Jesus to other people. Yeah? Think about that for a second. Now, this is very tangential, but go with me. Have you seen Jaws? One, just one. I mean, you can watch two if you want. Don't watch four. Even Michael Caine said he'd never seen four, but he liked the house that he bought his mother. So Jaws one. Do you remember Jaws 1? Yeah? Near the end, they go to get Jaws. Chief Brody finally see jo sees Jaws. And if you remember the film, Jaws comes up and out. And Chief Brody's words were this. We're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah? We're going to need a bigger boat. Soon, when Jesus is with Simon, they're fishing. We see the other Gospels talk about this. He's struggling with who Jesus is. Andrew's there, John and James is there. And what happens? They get an overwhelming, miraculous catch of fish, don't they? What do they need? They need a bigger boat. They need a bigger boat. They drag it to the shore. And even though it's overwhelming, then nets are not over full and jesus says to them you're not going to be catching fish anymore you're going to be catching people see the reality of our world is just this if we see jesus for who he really is and many of us say we do our thinking our action has to be for that catch philip and andrew show us that we are going to need a bigger boat you think about the way we do outreach and mission as a church. Our boat's very small. We need a bigger boat. Because when we have a bigger boat, people will catch more fish. We had a lovely little time in Super Cup for on Wednesday. Boys Brigade had a lovely sleepover last night. Girls Brigade will have had a great time on Friday night. That's a tiny boat in terms of the size of our community and the amount of people that don't know Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we believe what Philip does, what Andrew does, our priorities have to be consumed with helping people come to him. So, time is up. They'll have painted their towers over the road and sung the name of the Lord. It's a strong tower a lot. If God's spoken to you this morning, in some manner, don't leave your seats until someone has prayed with you. Tea and coffee won't be going anywhere. But let's think about our conviction. What we believe must manifest itself in our actions. We need to work on our boat. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for Andrew, for Philip, for all the disciples, Lord. They teach us many things, but here we see these two. They see that you are God and they are desperately convicted to get you to the people that they um, have around them. Lord, I pray that you would guide us, Lord, because each of us has so much to do in terms of life, but yet even more to offer to our world. You've placed us together. We've this as a family. 
or that we might display your splendor, that we might create spaces for people to encounter you. That, Lord, if our convictions are low or our priorities are spread, that's hard. Help us, Lord, to find what pleases you and to give ourselves to it. Lord, we thank you for all that we have, all that you give us. Lord, I do pray that you would lead us to be fishers of men. Lead us to catch people that they might find you and look at you and go, he is the Son of God. reminded of something lord as i was praying when we were praying before the service praying for your presence emily and i i had a picture in my head I, I and i know i wanted to share it i had a picture in my head of somebody and i couldn't see who it was being waterboarded which is incredibly horrible and i i had a um, sense in my head that that's how someone in church feels at the moment like they're being spiritually waterboarded. If that's a picture from you, Lord, I do pray that whoever that is, they feel just so oppressed and pushed back at the moment that it feels like they're just spiritually drowning. Lord, I, I pray for that person in Jesus' name and pray that they would stop and ask someone to pray for them, that they would step forward you might set them free from what's pressing them. Lord, bless us as we go into some worship and then have fellowship together. Lord, thank you for Claire and for Gina and our children. Thank you for our art pluses serving and running the technology today. All that we have, Lord, we thank you for. We pray you bless it. Amen. Amen. If, um, Tony, if you want to tell them that we're, we're finishing, um, we're going to sing Light of the World as our closing song Light of the World